Thank you so much, Andrea, for being here with me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Happy to be here. It's cool. So uh, for the people who are listening and watching, uh, we're at this like animal rights uh, conference and you're going to speak tomorrow. No, today. today. Oh my God, there's no actually tomorrow. But like, <laughs> yeah, there, there it's is almost like, yeah. over. <laughs> it's not Saturday today. <laughs> True. Good start. <laughs> nice. Uh, and what will your topic be about then? Well, I I heard that the attendees would be from uh, like a varied audience. So I was told that some mm. people are in organizations, but a lot of people do activism on the side and have other day jobs. They, I was told there would be like politicians and other yeah. folks attending. So I wanted to come up with a topic that I thought applied across all audiences. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily directly related to like, well, I guess it's directly related to the work I do, but it's focused on skill building, um, developing strong habits and how to do so in a way that's effective. Cool. Yeah. So it's a little more, yeah. I'd say it's a little more targeted to the public, whereas my work is more targeted toward organization, people and organizations. Oh, okay. Or like, what's the difference? So like, this yeah. one, so this talk is about, it can apply to anybody. It can apply to, you know, somebody who's works in government and is interested in animal activism, yeah. but isn't doing it full time. Um, it could apply to like a student, you know, in, in college or something like that. Yeah. My day-to-day -day work is focused on leaders of organizations, helping mm. them run their organizations more effectively, mm. like training staff and so on. So yeah. I think what I'm talking about applies to all those people. Mm. But what I do day-to-day -day in my work wouldn't necessarily apply to like a college student. It, I guess it yeah, could like potentially apply to, apply to someone <laughs> in government, but I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so right now uh, you're in Sharpen Strategy. Yes. And we also have Dave or David. Mm -hmm. um, and then we thought about, uh, because we're most likely going to have like both of you on the podcast, and then the difference will be, oh, of course, like we will talk about like you and your uh, life and career and so on, which I think is very different, uh, I guess, or I hope you yeah. like didn't have the exact same yeah. uh, like path. Um, but this was more about the like internal. Yeah, yeah. So Dave and I, we met um, through the Humane League. He was yeah. the executive director at the time. I was a, I, I found the organization volunteering. And um, we've worked together now at the Humane League for, I was there nine years, he was there 11. And um, wow. at the yeah. end, he was the president and I was the executive vice president. Mm. And so as president, he was doing all the outward facing stuff. So talking with funders um, in the media, mm. he was helping set the strategy of our campaigns. Mm. And my role or where I, I sort of developed into this role and so did he. My role is more focused on culture, um, the employee side of things, training, operations, structure, strategic planning, that sort of thing. So when we decided to leave the Humane Link together, we thought it's partly because our skills complement each other so well. So in this entity we have now, which is only like a few months old, um, we're helping organizations with all of those kinds of things. So fundraising, internal structures, culture, um, or uh, the strategy and campaigns and so on. And so we both can speak to both, yeah. but my specialty is more on like the internal people side of things. Is his mm. is more external strategy side of things. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then also to give some context, uh, like for you, as uh, but as we talked a little bit about before we jumped on this podcast, but for the people who listens and watch this as well, um, right now in the organizations I run, like we're also really going through like how to yeah sharpen our strategy <laughs> and like <laughs> nice. get better structure and so on um and i also think that like what we will talk about now will also be like like uh, my bias is at that like i'm uh yeah like trying to figure out this myself as well how, sure. to, how to get better that's great um and then hopefully people who listen and watch can also yeah get like value out of that yeah and also for the local chapter leaders and volunteers who is listening or watching this as well okay great. um but before we do that i, I want to get to know you better okay <laughs> uh, so like uh how how did you end up working where you are now like how did you get into like animal rights and why did you choose like the uh like not the campaigning for example or like the street activism maybe mm -hmm. you did before i'm not sure and like, how did you end up with the strategy and like the internal work and leadership work and so on? Yeah, I mean, it was sort of organic. I um, I have a degree in psychology, basically. Mm -hmm. it was, well, yeah, it's psychology. And um, 
I thought I was going to work in that field. I was doing brain research, actually. Wow. And I thought, um, I kept thinking I would love to find a way to combine psychology and helping animals. So I was looking for opportunities to do that. Um, tried some different jobs that were not really my taste. And then I found the Humane League at uh, a veg fest and mm. um, learned about, the, at that point, they had gotten Harvard University to commit to going cage free, which was going to save like 300,000 chickens. I was like, that's so cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I signed up to volunteer. And so I was doing street activism. I was doing a lot of leafletting. Cool. Yeah. And I remember thinking like just talking to people about changing their diets mm. is a really nice way to, to blend psychology and, and doing work for animals. Mm. So when I joined at that time, the Humane League was really small. I was the seventh employee. Our budget was like 600,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Super small. And at that yeah. point, our model was about each person kind of had a city that they managed. Mm -hmm. So Dave was overseeing Boston and mm -hmm. running the organization. And then they hired me to move to North Carolina and set up a chapter in Charlotte um, where we were doing leafletting, humane education, some small campaigns for universities in the area, fundraising, um, and building community. So yeah. I did a little bit of campaigning. Yeah. Um, it, I, I don't think I have the personality for it. I mean, I, I'll, I'll do the stuff behind the scenes. I'll go to protests, but I can't. Okay. Being the face of it, I think, was a little stressful for me. Mm. I did have some victories locally. I got one yeah. university <laughs> to change to cage free eggs, but cool. um, <laughs> but I also uh, identified a lot of areas where I thought the organization could improve, mm. like in our training, for example. When I started, there was not much training. There was not much internal communication. Um, so people would just go off to their city and kind of just be isolated alone. <laughs> so mm. I wrote a very long email to Dave outlining all the things I thought very kindly, but yeah. all the things I thought maybe we could do differently. And when he got it, he was like, great, why don't you do it? So I was like, okay. Wow. So for a few years there, I was doing the internal stuff and running the Charlotte office. And then with time, as the organization grew, my job just started to focus completely internally. So in addition mm -hmm. to managing, at that time, I was managing our grassroots team. I was also building our employee intranet and coming up with our goal setting process and our mm -hmm. internal communication patterns. And eventually that just became all that I did. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. And then it sounds like, it just continued because now you are also working like full time with that, but like in another organization. Yeah. How did that uh, like? Why not in the Humane League? And yeah. Like why? Yeah. Well, I we had talked at various times about ways for me to do that within the Humane League. Um, you know, the Humane League has the Open Wing Alliance, which is a mm -hmm. coalition of organizations all campaigning for chickens, and a big focus of that is training training groups how to campaign. Mm. And I, I would pitch sometimes we should train them about management. We should train them about running organizations. But I think I had so much work to do as the executive vice president. I didn't really have the capacity to also mm. be training other groups. Um, and basically, well, I did a lot of my own personal reflection. I, I got my um, master's in business, which was like a side thing. I would go once a month on the weekends to get my degree. Oh, wow. And through that, there was a lot of <laughs> <laughs> coaching. <laughs> Um, career coaching, like thinking about what you're good at. And basically I thought I'm more, mm. I'm more of a startup leader. I love mm. the humane league. I mean, I think very yeah. highly of that organization, but I guess I got to a point where I felt my skills and interests were no longer a good match for the job. Mm. And I thought, I also think it's super healthy to have turnover of leaders. I think sometimes people mm. hold on in the same job for too long mm. The Humane League at that point was like 125 staff. The budget was, wow. I mean, I think that year we got a huge grant. I mean, I think the budget was like 22 million when I was leaving. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it was a very different organization than when I joined. It was great. Cool. <laughs> but I was just thinking yeah. I'd rather help groups at a younger stage. Mm. And I think the Humane League can really benefit from a new perspective in this role. So. Cool. So Dave and I, we we're both kind of coming to that decision at the same time. We thought it was best for us to leave together because we don't want to scare the staff by staggering it or something. So mm. we uh, we found our replacements. His had to wait a few more months to join. So we did leave a few months apart. But yeah, okay, we yeah. left to do this work to help smaller groups kind of uh, avoid some of the challenges that we avoided uh, that we had at the Humane League. Wow. Yeah. And I guess like since I run to small organizations we fit into that category maybe yeah. um like what what are some of the like the common things that you help out with so we have a list of categories of the the kinds of things we'll work on i can go a little deeper though but some of those yeah. things would be like uh the 
the board of directors, making sure that's independent and well run Mm -hmm. fundraising strategy, um, culture, making sure that's defined and people really get it. Um, structure and processes, I'm doing this off the top of my head, uh, strategy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think what maybe the key trends that I've seen, mm-hmm. well, some groups are so new or small that they don't even have a board. Maybe they don't even have a mission. Mm-hmm. But I think more broadly, the things I'll see in a group is growing is that leaders have a hard time delegating mm-hmm. either because of wanting to maintain control you know when you start Mm. a group you kind of you feel like you know how to do everything it's hard Um, or this feeling especially as a group grows much larger this feeling that especially like from an ea mindset of being smart with your resources i don't think people really value just like talking and giving advice and that sort of thing and when you're a leader of a big group i think the best thing you can be doing is just like talking to people about the strategy like getting FaceTime with the employees giving guidance not like doing projects doing tasks okay and i think um people don't see i think sometimes people have a hard time accepting that they think they should be doing stuff to prove their worth Hmm. so that's one big thing i could go into more if you'd like some of the trends i see yeah okay yeah sure yeah okay (laughs) Um, (laughs) so that's definitely one of them i think Mm. another big challenge we see in our space is, um, with fundraising. Mm. I don't know about your organization, but even in Europe and uh, I mean, all around the world, a lot of groups are funded by U S funders. Um, in the U S we have a couple of funders that have big foundations, like huge Mm. (laughs) foundations. And so they can make really large grants. Mm. So some of these small groups, like giant percentage of their budget is funded by one foundation. Okay. Like 80% or more. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, which is great for them that they've been able to grow and yeah. that they have those resources. But it's really risky because okay. as much yeah. as this foundation can promise we're going to renew this money and if they ultimately decide they're not interested in funding anymore, they'll phase it out over a few years. Mm. Still, we don't know what's going to happen. Like, we don't know, you know, there's that whole hit by a bus thing. Mm. Like, we don't, you don't know really what's going to happen. Yeah. And so we'll work with organizations to try to diversify their funding. Okay. Hit by a bus, by the way. Is that like if the funder gets hit? Yeah. Or like, <laughs> yeah. You don't, yeah. Yeah. Or, or the person. Like. So um, a lot of this is based on relationships. There's, it's not so much mm. the person with the money, but they hire people to help choose where the money's going to go. Mm. And those people develop relationships, right? And then someone yeah. might come along who, I don't know, has a different perspective or Mm. I don't know how risky that really is. I think it's more like the risk of going into a recession. Um, A lot of their money's tied up in the stock market. And if that, you know, takes a big hit, then Mm. that can dramatically reduce their funding. Or if the people running the foundation suddenly decide a different cause is worth prioritizing, that could reduce the funding. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's best to have funding coming from a variety of sources, you know, to make sure that you're set up for sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, actually, maybe I can comment on, uh, like, as we go a little sure. bit, because on the first one, um, uh, like, about leaders having a hard time delegating and so on, uh, yeah, I can really relate to that. And we've been trying, like, so many different times to, like, give ownership and, like, delegate. And at times it works. And then, but, like, since we're all based on, well, like, uh, at that time we were all like volunteers so like mm. at this point we're almost still all volunteers we have like four part-time employees okay cool um but yeah we don't have enough to like or like we could maybe merge them all to have like one full time but we would rather like split it up a little bit yeah that makes sense um and yeah like we're, we're still really having a hard time to delegate but what we've found out lately is that by having more like routine documents or like having uh, like being really specific about like the roles and so on and having regular meetings it seems to work better now but it have it hasn't been happening for such a long period that i know it's like yeah that is actually working um what are the challenges that you see when you delegate is it about the work being done at all or being done the way you want it to be done or what what do you see go wrong um <laughs> yeah, it's it's different things. Like one specific uh, is that, uh, for example, for when we have tasks such as for, I'm just 
trying to think how much I can say, how much I not should say. <laughs> or you could tell me trends yeah. you see if you want, rather than talking yeah, specifically but this about is, yours. I think like the one I'm talking about now, because this is one specific role, I, I think this is a good way to talk about it. Yeah, like, or, or like uh, in the board, for example, uh, we can start there. Then, um, because then you have joined the, the board and then we have like several tasks, like some is like economic responsible, for example, and some has some responsibility for social media. Um, yeah, uh, and then we tend to, uh, well, like, yeah, the trend is you're given a task, but you're just not doing it basically. Like, it, and then it takes like weeks, and then we're like, oh yeah, I forgot. Like, I'm supposed to do this every day or every single other day, and so on. Um, and then we always always get to this point where it's been like weeks or something. Yeah. Uh, and for me as well, like as the leader, like um. I didn't check in after like two weeks and then like, how is it going? And then, oh no, I stopped like the day after basically. Um, mm. th did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Kind of. Yeah, I think there are unique challenges for delegation when people are volunteers or part-time. I yeah. think that's extra challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think when people are not full-time employees and they have other priorities in their life, maybe bigger priorities, who knows, mm. I think that can be extra challenging because they're not just sitting there devoting their whole work day to, to that job. I mean, obviously that's, you should be recruiting volunteers. Like I think it's something you just need to figure out. Um, but I would imagine if, if you as the leader are also someone who's not fulfilling, like doing what you say you're going to do on time, mm. then that's setting a model for everybody else. Mm. Like if he doesn't do it, why should I? I mean, I remember <laughs> When in the early days of the Humane League, we had um, we were doing these weekly reports where we listed out all the things we did that week. Yeah. One week I forgot. I just completely forgot. And no one said anything. Nothing yeah. happened. <laughs> so then the next week I was like, well, screw it. I'm not going to do this report. I'm going to go take do my weekend. You know, yeah. No one said anything again. Okay. And I'm the kind yeah. of person that I do the things I say I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. And so then finally, a couple weeks later, I reached out to one of the people who was supposed to read them. I was like, hey. <laughs> Mm. Like, just want to tell you what's happening here. Like, mm. I have zero motivation. To, why should I do this if no one's going to, if there's going to be nothing that happens if I don't? Yeah. And I think we don't want to run organizations where, you know, we're punishing people. I'm not, I'm not pro like discipline, but I think you need to at least notice. Um, maybe it's about like celebrating when someone does something really well, or at least noticing um, people need to feel mm. like there's a good reason to do what they're doing. Yeah. I think sometimes with volunteers, it can also be about like just task management systems. So, you know, a lot of groups use things like Asana or their Trello or whatever. Yeah. We can yeah. have it laid out. That can help. But mm. I think it's usually about people want to feel like there's a good reason why, um, yeah. why they should do the things they're asked to do. Mm. So, yeah, I think with volunteers, that's extra challenging. Yeah. Um, you need to keep them motivated. And it's not like you can threaten to fire them. You know, that's not their job yeah, anyway. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so I think it's more about it's like yeah. more about the positive aspects of, mm. of why they should get it done. Maybe it's helping them see how it's going to affect the overarching campaign and ultimately yeah, yeah. affect the animals or something like that. Yeah, hmm. yeah like, OK, so uh, we used Trello before, for mm -hmm. example, and then like that that's also a specific thing. Like we laid out the tasks and then it went like weeks and then we like checked in. It's like all red, like deadlines are yeah. like <laughs> all gone. And we're like, oh, no, like how did we end up here again? Um, so we just stopped doing that. But <laughs> now we're back. And all, now mm -hmm. we use like Notion. OK. And um, so far, so good. Like everyone is like, oh, wow, so good system. Like uh, we're that's all good. like pumped up. So the mo motivation right now is really good. But um yeah we'll see how it goes but but like what we do here in oslo for example the city where we're at right now um then we see uh like the really the culture thing or like the community thing is like helping a lot mm -hmm. and we're really lucky that for i think it was last year then we for the first time got like funding to local chapters um so for three years ago we for the first time received like governmental funding and then they are after like governmental funding, but only to local chapters. Like it's not allowed or like we can keep 5% no. national, but like 95% has to go to the local chapters and they decide what to do. So like uh, me as like the, and like me and the board, we can't tell people what they're going to do, but they have to follow our guidelines though. Mm -hmm. But that's like vegan guidelines. So it's just like, but like, yeah. Um, 
but now we see that uh, by doing like self-care events and so on it seems to really engage and like one insight i got is for example at this conference i was really happy when i went into swap card and i searched for world saving hustle or yeah and i see that many people have like identified as like yeah, yeah. like i'm part of that group and then i'm like oh nice like they are doing a good job here yeah um so i i can see some trends there to what can work um but i am afraid that like the same thing will happen again that like the people who are ac- active now will not be here next year or like yeah. the year after and so on um because they're so like changing out so many times if that makes sense yeah um i guess that's normal yeah or like maybe not or like how can we keep volunteers for a longer time yeah i mean i think it's hard especially depending what age they are like i think people are more likely to volunteer when they're in school for example and then they graduate and get a job or yeah yeah you know depending what stage they are in their life and their career Mm. um but, you know, an organization I really admire for how they've managed volunteers is Anima or Atwartik Lake. Yeah. And I think if you haven't, well, I, you spoke to somebody already, but you, they're, yeah. they're a great organization to talk to about that. And in their early stages, a lot of their like serious roles were were supported by volunteers. Um, in the U.S., it's actually we're not even allowed to do that. Um, allowed to do what? Legally, like we can't have a volunteer doing a job that's critical to the organization. Oh, but wow. they had people yeah. like even their ED was a volunteer for a long What's time, ED? like executive director, the, okay, the leader yeah, of yeah. the group. They had like their legal person was a volunteer and so yeah. on. And I can't speak exactly to what they did. But from what I understand, it's a lot of like giving people ownership, giving mm. them power um, and really like recognizing and appreciating that person. And I think sometimes why delegation doesn't work is we rush it um, and we don't. Well, at many levels, I suppose. But one being that we don't make clear what is even, why are we doing this? What does success look like? What's the goal? You know, if you're asking someone to do a task. But then I think we don't spend enough time thinking about the individual. What do they need? How can I? There's there's actually a great resource. There's this organization called the Management Center in the U.S. Okay. They only focus on social justice organizations. They have Mm. a website that lists out all these tools, um, things on like developing people, delegation, performance reviews, like dealing with performance issues. It's great. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) they have something called the delegation worksheet Mm -hmm. where you first lay out what does success look like? Mm -hmm. um, And then a bunch of details of like, is there any context you need to know? Not like what exactly are you supposed to do? But for example, like, hey, we've done this before and here are some of the things we ran into. But then another piece that's important is how and when are we going to check in on progress? So for example, in your case, I don't know if you were just checking in with people ad hoc, but if you could say instead, in one week from today or a month from today, depending on the project, like let's check in and you should be at X stage and we'll give feedback, whatever. Mm. Um, why am I saying this? Because I think sometimes <laughs> we rush, not just delegation, but you know, you're busy, especially if you're an organization that doesn't have full-time staff, that means mm. you probably have a lot more on your plate. But I think one thing leaders are not prioritizing enough is thinking about what does retention look like? Like that's part of your job as a leader, thinking about what are the things I need to do to keep people engaged, whether they're volunteers or staff. Mm. Um, And that's, well, I don't know if we want to go into that. I have more I could say on delegation, but I think that's another (laughs) common pitfall that we see with leaders of being just kind of caught up in the day to day and not really prioritizing that work that's about building the community and keeping people and getting them aligned and making sure we're all on the same page. Okay. Uh, do you have some other things in mind of like, uh, yeah, what's yeah. important to talk about? Yeah. Well, I think, I guess before we pivot off of delegation, one, one more thing that came to mind that I think applies with volunteers as well. And your question of how do we keep them engaged? Mm. A big piece of it is that ownership. So I think a mistake people make when you're new to management or yeah, I guess when you're just a new leader is wanting things to be done right. Also, when we have limited resources, we want things to be done fast on time. And you hear people say, I'd rather do it myself, you know, get to get it done right than then give yeah. it to somebody else to do a not such a good job. I can relate. Um, right. <laughs> but um, if people don't feel ownership over it, they're way less likely to be engaged. And I think you can see that at the task level, but also like org wide. So, for example, sometimes leaders may be so 
invested in the success of a project or the organization that they're dictating to people, this is exactly how you need to do this thing step by step by step by step. Mm. And if you receive a task like that, it's very, it's like not empowering. It's not exciting to go yeah. do like check off all these boxes. This is exactly how you do it. So instead, if you say to somebody, so for example, I want you to set up a podcast. I could say, mm. and these are exactly the people I want you to interview. These are the exact topics you mm. should do. Everything should be 30 minutes long. Here's the equipment I want you to buy. You're just going to feel like, I don't know, like my administrative like staff or a robot or something, like checking off a bunch of boxes. Yeah, yeah. But instead, you can say something like, we're going to do a podcast. Maybe we even work together to think about what's the overall goal of it or the purpose. Uh, maybe we set, work together to set some guidelines of like, who, what in general is a good guest who, sorry, who in general is a good guest um, who might be not worth having, but otherwise you have the freedom to, mm. to do it. Mm. And that's way more exciting for you. Mm. And it feels like your thing and it's your successes, yeah. your failures, if you mess it up. And so then you're going to want to keep doing it. Yeah. But if you do my checklist and then you mess up, first of all, you're like, Ugh. <laughs> I mean, mm. that maybe I'm mad. I don't know. But I don't think that you feel you're not going to be as creative of trying to avoid problems because you're like, well, you didn't, you didn't think of that. That's your, you know, it's my fault. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that figuring out ways to give more ownership is really important for that retention aspect too. And I think that's an issue. Not every leader has, I think mm. that some leaders go the exact opposite mm. and give people way too much autonomy, which has its own other side of issues. But yeah. I think that can be another big one. I can relate to both of those, like in, in the beginning and also when we didn't have money, for example, then I think it was really like, no, no, as long as you stay within our guidelines, you can do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then many ended up not doing anything, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we got money, then it's like, uh, you can apply to have this money to do self-care events, but it's up to you, like what type of self-care events you okay. want, for example. Um, so I can see the trend there and also how that works here, at least. For now, but yeah, yeah, we'll see. When it comes to the, those events, for example, I think, as we talked about before, as a leader, your job is to get people aligned on like, what is the overall mission? What's the purpose? Like, why are we doing this? And what does, what does success look like in the big picture? Like, what does a successful event look like? I don't know. For you, mm. maybe it's actually people feeling better because they did self-care. Maybe it's about bringing in more volunteers Mm. Maybe it's about spreading awareness about your organization. Maybe it's multiple things. Yeah. But I think if you get really clear on that, and then, as you said, any specific guidelines, like this would be illegal <laughs> or like here are the rules, Yeah. making that really clear, but then let them go do it. If they know mm. like your job is to get as many people signed up as possible, then you might not know as the leader what's the best way to do that. And they could be in the moment on the spot like, oh, wow, if we go over to, to this, I don't know, venue down the street, look at all those people, like look at these kids or oh, there's a university and you can negotiate going into the school. Like it mm. gives people a lot more room to be creative and mm. solve problems. Um, and I think that's really when you take a step back, a big part of the role of the leader is this alignment, like getting people aligned on what is the purpose? What are our goals? And it's something I think that most leaders rush, that we don't mm. really invest in that time. And so one of the courses I took in my, my business school the woman teaching it was a CEO actually of a nonprofit. And she was saying that every year, one of the first things she does, she sits down with her assistant and they plan out her calendar for making sure she talks to every employee on staff. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one. it could be like a team meeting. Okay. And it's, yeah. but it's usually more than once. So mm -hmm. sitting down with people, like just getting them all aligned. Yeah. And you know, you have to repeat things over and over and over for people to really get them. <laughs> so it'd be like yeah. every call, she's tying something back to the overarching goals or the overarching mission. Mm. And I just don't think we do that. I think that we are biased to think we need to be doing like projects, doing tasks. I think, I don't know, you think if you send an email out once, people get it. <laughs> you don't really invest. Mm. It can be, it can feel tedious, I think. But once you start doing it and you see the benefits of it, I think you can realize how important it is to prioritize that. Mm. So like really, if I'm going to take a step back, I mm. think one of the biggest issues I see um, in our movement and probably in nonprofits, maybe in business in general, is just about how leaders choose to spend their time. I think that we often mm. we spend time on things that feel urgent, but aren't necessarily yeah. important. And we need to be thinking about the things that are important, but not necessarily urgent. So that's like taking time to reflect 
taking time to repeat the strategy again, mm. um, taking time to think about these questions of retention or how to delegate better, assessing what's going wrong. I think that's one of the key issues I see. And it's easier for me to say it <laughs> here and now, <laughs> but when I was the executive vice president at THL, like I had a mm. lot of work to do. And mm. I knew this in my heart. <laughs> I knew that this is how I should be spending my time. But it took a lot of work to like free up some of that time in my schedule. Mm. Um, and then even once you have that time, I mean, maybe you're so burnt out that like, like I would try to do reflection, I might just fall asleep. So, you know, easier said <laughs> than done. But I think it's something that as a movement, we really need to be thinking about how we're spending our time. Exactly. Wow. Um, yeah. How we're spending our time. Is there, uh, or like, uh, if I would just ag agree to that, like, like I do, I think I do agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or like, okay, uh, several, several thoughts come to mind. So one is that, uh, like when I get time to reflect, that's often when like good ideas come or I solve problems. I didn't even think I was gonna sit there and solve kind of, but like, Oh, like, Oh, that's amazing or something. Um, but yeah, like it, it also feels a bit weird, I think, um, to do that. But but how can we get better at that, do you think? And is is it possible to like include that maybe in some local chapter workshops and so on to also be like, uh, this is something uh, we should do more of, like reflect yeah. more and like here are some examples of how you can do that. Or I is, is so. it basically just like, take time off or like, no, uh, I, I, well, yes and no. Yeah. I think taking yeah. time off is good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can think of a lot of examples. So one of my friends works in an organization who just, just this year started something where they're sending members of their leadership teams on like personal retreats where they'll go, they'll get mm -hmm. a hotel or something in their own town for like two days where they're not supposed to be plugged into anything and just like think Wow. Which I, I've, I, I actually didn't hear that much. I, she told me it went great, but okay. I didn't hear that many details. Okay. But that that's like a, I think, next level version of it. That's so cool. Yeah. Like in Norway, we have this like free cabins where you can rent oh, or like awesome. almost free if you're a member of this like uh, yeah. cabin club or something. That sounds great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I've been thinking about that actually doing oh, cool. like going around. Uh, so it's really cool to hear that somebody has been yeah. doing. Yeah, an organization in the U.S. Wow. When one of my first jobs um, out of college, actually, I was like working at the front desk. But the mm. one of the um, practices there was that every person, um, more the like leadership staff, they had to start their day with 30 minutes of either learning or reflection. That was just the that was just the protocol. That's okay. how the organization worked. At and so the, this like, was actually uh, like a a uh, physical therapy office, strangely enough, um, yeah. my first job. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so even at a physical therapy office, the mm. staff there were like reflecting on like, how can I do a better job with my patients? What might we do differently as an organization? Wow. Or they're reading a book on like leadership or whatever it is. So that was something where the, the mm. owner of the business proved to people he invested in it because he was making them do that as part of their time. Yeah. I think some leadership books, they, they might set aside two hours on a Friday or something like that. Mm. But I think you can also do it at retreats. You know, you can bring people together and reflect together. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be an independent exercise. True. Mm. And then one other example I'm thinking of, I have a friend who's a CEO of an organization that's like over almost 30 entities. It's a big, big company. And um, he just like goes for walks. Yeah. And he's like, I think he really had an influence on me because he said, that counts as work. He's like, you go for a walk alone, you know, just with your thoughts. That's sometimes when you think of the best ideas or mm. where things really, or, you know, in the shower, people always say, right? Yeah, yeah. He's like, that should count <laughs> as work. Like, you should feel okay doing that in your work day. Yeah. And, you know, you have to find a balance, especially working mm. for nonprofits that where you have funders. You don't want to, you know, take like two and a half days a week doing that. Yeah, yeah. But I think at least doing maybe an hour a week mm. would be a good start. So, yeah, there are ways you can do it in retreats with like workshops where you give people prompts and have quiet time. You bring them together, you talk yeah. together, or it can be this independent exercise. But yeah, hmm. I did a course actually, again, in my business school where they talked about the practices of the most effective leaders. And they said taking time for reflection hmm. um, is super important. In that case, they gave us a list of questions of like, okay, what yeah. are my goals? How did I like work toward them today? How am I yeah. going to work toward them tomorrow? So, Wow. All sorts of different ways you can do it. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> do do you have any other uh like I, I really want to go more to leadership sure. uh, as well or like i feel we touched into that a little bit like do, do you have some common or like is it only leaders you work with in uh, sharpen strategy or? more or less yeah i mean okay. yes i would say for the most part because so I gave a talk at CARE, which you said you, you saw the, the, you pulled it up on YouTube briefly. Yeah. And um, it was about leadership development. And the reason I gave that talk was because I was seeing this trend and we did it at the Humane League. I did it at the Humane League <laughs> where you're like, people need to be trained. So you just send them away to some external training and bring them back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But for leadership development to be really successful there needs to be an internal investment in it as well. And so Dave and I are helping groups be more effective. We're helping them be more sustainable. But uh, for example, I had one person say, hey, could you train my managers? No, I'm not going to train your managers. Like maybe I would do a good job, but no, you should train your managers. And I can train you to train your managers. Uh -huh. Because the thing is, if the leader is not bought in, if the yeah. leader doesn't even know what these people are being trained on, it's mm. not its not really going to work. Mm. Like, I think it's okay to send someone to an external training, mm -hmm. but then when they come back, there needs to be a structure of, like, how are you now implementing what you've learned? Making sure the person who's managing you mm. um, gets it and can, like, yeah. help make sure that that learning sticks. If it's, mm. if it's a training to change the organization, so, for example a lot of the stuff that we'll do might be stuff that would happen through HR or operations, but we're not just gonna work with those people because if we're trying to change the organization, we need the leader to be on board to see the value of it because if the leader's mm. not on board and people try to change it, it's not gonna work. People okay, yeah. look to the leader for what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So mm. we're focused more on the leader and then we can help the leader help other teams okay, make changes. Yeah. So, like, uh, like, uh, can everybody like can can everybody join like can I apply to join and like what does that include or like uh, how does that work? Yeah, so we're uh, still <laughs> we're still figuring some things out. So yeah, um, and for I people listening and watching, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, great, yeah, thank you. Um, we've only been around for a couple of months now, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm guessing as time goes on, we will adapt and probably change what we do. But for right now we're offering a spectrum of help where it goes from the one side, which is very intensive partnerships where we're like doing an assessment of the organization and mm -hmm. working long-term with the leadership to try to make changes in the organization. We can only help, help a couple groups at a time with that model. Makes sense. Yeah. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we're gonna do trainings that are gonna be okay. like one to many where anyone can sign up for those. Mm. And then in the middle, we're doing some coaching for leaders. Mm. As far as the intensive partnerships go, we already probably have more people who want it than we have the capacity to help right wow. now. Yeah. But if anybody's interested, they can reach out. I'd yeah, rather yeah, people yeah. reach out than not. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think there's a lot more capacity for the coaching and then definitely the trainings. Mm. We don't have any trainings like ready to go yet, but we're planning to launch those in the summer. Wow. Um, Interesting. Our website's not even up yet, but it will be <laughs> in the next. Well, it'll probably be up by the time you launch this podcast. Cool. Sharpenstrategy.org. Nice. <laughs> and it has a, um, like a sign up, like a contact form. So I think cool. that's probably the best thing for now. Of like, you could say, put me on the list for when a training comes okay, out. Okay, cool. We're looking at trainings maybe about goal setting. I was thinking mm. about one today about mm. change management. Mm. Um, we'll probably do some on fundraising, campaign nice. strategy. We're not really sure yet, but if okay. people want to reach out, we can, we'll probably have, a, I'm guessing we'll have a mailing list at some point. Yeah. It's still early days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Though. yeah. And, and do you have like, until that time we can say like, do you have any good, uh, like resources about like the things we've been talking about now that you would like to recommend? Yes, yeah. I think that management center that I was saying is yeah. managementcenter.org. I yeah. know a lot of people in our movement, I mean, they see it as like the single source of truth. They have trainings, they have wow. online trainings. Okay, yeah. It's it's based in the US, and mm. so some of it might be a little American. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I found it to be great. Cool. Um, there's a company called the Center for Creative Leadership that also does trainings that you have to pay. For, well, you have to pay for Management Center too, but they have a sliding scale, but depending on okay. your budget. I think yeah. CCL is a bit, probably a little bit more expensive. Yeah. Um, there's a great book called The First Time Manager that I read a long time ago. I think even if you've been managing for a little while or even a few years, I think it's a great book. Mm. I'm trying to think of others. That's probably a good place to start. You know, um, 
there are organizations here at this conference that are doing these kinds of things. So like Open Wing Alliance, for example, you join yeah. that if you're doing campaigns for chickens, um, but they do trainings on campaign strategy. Mm. I know Anima International is putting together a resource database for things sure. like yeah. movement building and so on. Yeah. So I think just staying connected to people in the movement is yeah. a great way to find mm. these resources. Mm. Um, but as far as the very specific things go about like being a stronger leader and delegation, Management Center is probably the cheapest and easiest recommendation. They have a book and they yeah. have that great website. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Do you have any other things um, you want to talk about or you think it's important to mention? Yes. Some parting, some parting thoughts. Um, I think that when we start organizations or people get into advocacy, there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement that's really great. Mm. And I think people are very passionate about the cause. And then what ends up happening is a lot of folks start a new organization because they're excited, they've got great mm. ideas, mm. Um, but don't necessarily have that leadership experience. Mm. That's okay. I think yeah. it's better to have these organizations run by people who are passionate about the work, of mm. course. But one big thing I think is important is finding somebody to be a, like a coach or a mentor. Mm. That can be a family member. For me, it actually, my boss from the physical therapy place, yeah. he ended up so many years later being my mentor at the Humane League. And oh my God, it was so helpful. Wow. Un you would never think. <laughs> it was so helpful. Cool. Like he helped us figure out our core values process um, set for setting up core values. And he helped me through a lot of difficult employee situations. Wow. But I think finding that person or people um, hmm. is something that we don't do, especially being young. Um, people who are, well, myself included, like I didn't, I felt weird asking for help, felt annoying, felt like I should know how to do this stuff. And hmm. that's something I really regret. If I could go back in time, hmm. I would have talked with people like peers that are running other organizations. I would have talked with like my dad, you know, my dad used to run a business. Like wow. I can, there's plenty yeah, yeah. of people you can <laughs> talk to uh, or find, you know, you can go to networking events for people who, I don't know, like mm. leaders in business or something and probably f ask somebody. And you mm. can ask by saying like, could we have one call? You don't need to be like, will you be my mentor for the rest of my life? You can say, can we have one call? Yeah. <laughs> and then say, hey, could we do that again? That was super helpful. Yeah. And just let it evolve organically. That's a huge one. Mm. And then another thing, as I said already, is just being really thoughtful about how you spend your time Mm. and believing that there is value in the stuff that's not urgent. Yeah. And mm. if you're facing challenges or, yeah, if you're having trouble maintaining staff or your volunteers are, are leaving or mm. you're not as effective as you once were, I think sometimes we feel like we need to push, do more, 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 like bring out a bunch more volunteers mm. when maybe what you should do is stop for a second, maybe have a retreat. It could be online. doesn't yeah, have to be in yeah. person. But, like, li really dig mm. into what's going wrong here and just take that time mm. Because if you can take that time up front, then you can be way more effective and faster later. Mm. Like that time investment up front will save you time in the long run. Mm. So I think just some just some ways to think about the work and think about leadership that don't think is are very common in this movement. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea, yeah, for welcome. taking the time. Yay. Thank you for having me. Yay. That's exciting. <laughs> I'm excited for your work.